Thanks very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, talk with you today and uh, share with you uh, a few things. I must say, having heard this wonderful team of physicians and healthcare uh, advocates this morning, uh, they have covered so much, including things I hadn't known about until uh, today, that I may not be able to add very much to what you've already heard from them, but I will do my best. I will say a few words, if I can, about this organization. It was established by Dorothy Trainer Kingsbury, and then, of course, you met Don a little bit earlier, and they worked very hard for many years to make this work, and one thing that they did that I think almost no other organization of patients uh, I have seen has been able to do is there was not a physician's organization in this field. And this group of people 25 years ago made it happen. And so these are the current people who are leading that, the organization. And just to show you how much things have changed, on the day this was begun, 25 years ago, there were only four physicians who considered themselves to be interested in MSA as a professional interest. And now we believe there are 198 in the United States who do that. So things have changed a great deal. And uh, this organization had a lot to do with that. Also, the publications, there were only five articles 25 years ago that had been about this. Now, uh, 3,127 articles in the medical literature on MSA. So this has been a very good time, but so much more needs to be done. And the central problem and why you're here is that we have not yet discovered the exact cause of MSA, but we're getting closer all the time. And our first goal, and I'm going to be able to go through a number of these slides very quickly because some of them have been dealt with already by previous speakers, but our first goal was to try to deal with the Parkinsonian cerebellar and autonomic aspects of the disease. And you've heard a lot about that today. I would just summarize by saying that the first line treatments to raise pressure acutely are to ingest water, 16 ounces of water, that will give you 40 millimeters of mercury for one hour. And remember that food, a dessert, um, uh, pie, cake, will lower blood pressure by about the same amount for about the same length of time. So food and water change the blood pressure in opposite ways. If you ever need to acutely change pressure in a person. And then there's exercise. Uh, exercise is important as long as you can do it. Uh, early on, if you can exercise in water, that may be very helpful too. And then the third line is the drugs, fludrocortisone you've heard about, and the presser drugs like mitodrine and perhaps soon, droxydopa. I, because these have been discussed, I'm going to move past most of them. I will mention that a drug used to treat uh, children with hyperactivity, Stratera, or atomoxetine, is quite effective in patients with MSA at the pediatric dose, the same dose we give to kindergarten children. That dose in MSA will raise pressure considerably in most individuals for a few hours. So I think that we need more experience with it, but that's something to watch for in the future. Our second goal has been to try to see if there are genes that are responsible for MSA. And that has been a very difficult problem. We now know that there are 27,000 genes and they are contributors to a great many of the things that make us different. There are 600,000 places in the DNA where people commonly have a different, a different letter in their genetic alphabet. 
And those 600,000 things are the things that make us, some of us have different color hair or be bigger or smaller or whatever. And also in some cases those can contribute to susceptibility to have diseases. So in the early days of MSA, uh, let's say around 2000, when we were trying to see what genes looked like they might be important, we um, looked at this group and although they looked like they might be answers, they didn't prove to be answers. All of them proved to be normal in patients with MSA. Of course, along the way, we did find some new diseases in those first two. We found people who had diseases that looked a bit like MSA due to the absence of those genes in their healthy form, but it wasn't true MSA. But still, it, it allowed us to find very effective treatment for those first two diseases, DBH deficiency and norepinephrine transport deficiency. And then we keep looking and, and we keep hoping. So in July of this year, there was a very important and exciting report that 32% of unrelated Japanese patients with uh, MSA of the cerebellar variety had an abnormality due to uh, an SHC2 gene copy number mutation. And so we hoped that would be the thing we were looking for. However, we analyzed our patients at Vanderbilt and found that none of our uh, 105 patients with MSAC had that copy number mutation. So it, it is the, perhaps important in the form of the disease in Japan, but not in the form in the United States. But the concept of copy number mutations is a new concept of the last two or three years and may lead us in new directions. As people get older, uh, the telomere, the end of the chromosomes, become a little bit frayed. And there can be some spontaneous changes in some of the genes out there in that area. And that may be one area that we're going to find that will help us understand the cause of MSA. A third goal of our MSA research is to dissociate uh, pathological protein aggregations that we find in both human subjects and mouse models of MSA. Alpha-synuclein, which is shown in that slide, it's a very thin thing in that slide, but alpha-synuclein seems to be, if not the culprit, it's, it's everywhere we see, everywhere we look in diseases of neurodegeneration, Parkinson's, MSA, many others, we see the alpha-synuclein in aggregates. And here you see some staining in a mouse model created by Dr. Maslia in San Diego. And in this mouse model, uh, the, uh, the, the mice were bred to have increased amounts of alpha-synuclein. And then different drugs were tested to see if they would reduce that, uh, those aggregations or stop their further development. And they found that the further development was indeed stopped. And in some cases, they were able to scale back the production of new lesions. So this has led us to try to go back and find new treatments. And there are two major drug trials that have been undertaken in the last uh, year and a half. The first of these was Resagiline. Perhaps some of you participated in that study. That study is now completed. The data is being analyzed. We should know within six months if resagiline is altering the course of MSA. A second drug that is being studied now, and we are in the middle of the recruitment for that study, is rifampicin. Rifampicin is an old Tuberculosis drug, also used to treat staph infections sometimes. 
and has a pretty long track record uh, of use. Uh, and we thought carefully and decided that this is the one we should bring forward because in the mouse model of MSA, rifampicin treatment of the mice stopped the formation of aggregates of synuclein. And in some cases, one could hopefully see a little bit of scale back of some of the aggregations that were already there. Based upon that, an experience in other neurodegenerative disease, we have launched this trial to see if this drug will be helpful. This drug is in general well tolerated. Um, there are uh, a few side effects in some people, but most people uh, have not experienced any side effects at all. Another approach to treatment that was mentioned earlier today is the IVIG uh, study being done by Peter Novak uh, in the University of Massachusetts. The IVIG study is based upon the hope that some inflammatory process in MSA is going on and that suppression of inflammation might make people better. And then a fourth uh, goal of our research is to see if gene therapy or stem cell therapy might one day be helpful in this disease. Stem cells are sometimes used in Korea, uh, in China, uh, and in Cologne, Germany, and perhaps other sites to treat MSA. We have little experience, well, no experience in the United States with this. We have seen patients before and after they had this. And although I do not believe I see benefit uh, to those patients, I would have to also say that I, don't, I didn't see any great harm that came to patients who went to China for this treatment. But I, I cannot say that I have seen benefit. Uh, some of the patients felt they might have benefited, but most thought they probably did not. And during the questioning, if any of you who have personal experience with this, we would all be very pleased to hear from you. And the concerns we have are, are did the cells that are injected actually get into the brain? We don't know that. Did the cells injected go to the right places in the brain? We don't know that. And if they get to those right places, are they able to help once they get there. So those are all pretty serious concerns. And the reason that you haven't seen stem cell studies of this in the United States is that uh, the people at the National Institutes of Health feel it's too soon and are not willing to support studies that uh, are going in that direction. And the people, the neurologists and other experts feel that that is probably not an unreasonable uh, attitude for them to have.